Hey, Shemai, sit a key, Christ, yo, Christ, oi. What is cracking, boys, girls, ladies, gents, and anybody who identifies as a uh, as a sorcerer? Today we are talking about fighting fantasies, crypt of the sorcerer, and it, it is a uh, spoilers. It's a really, really good book. So a little bit of background on the uh, crypt of the sorcerer. You know, it had two working titles, crypt of the necromancer and the howling tunnels, and it's published back in '87 by Puffin. Then it's published early 2000s by Wizard, and then it wasn't republished by Scholastic. What are the odds? But, 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 but before I get further into this video, we got some Minecraft uh, gameplay in the background. Uh, just a cheeky little update on the fighting fancy village I was gonna make. Uh, my last villager was uh, sort of bum rushed by two zombies in the middle of the night. He's uh, he expires. You know, so I got no villagers, and then the one golem that was meant to be protecting him, he sort of just fell into a pond, so now I've got no golem. So yeah, you know, in the footage, the footage originally was meant to be me in the nether, but the moment I entered the nether, I was immediately attacked. I still don't know what, uh, well, I was knocked into lava, still don't know what by, and I got game over it. So, uh, you're gonna see me going in, just battering whatever's close by. And then I'm just trying to figure out what to do now because obviously I got nothing going on in the village. There's another village further down the road that I might try to steal their villagers and make a human. I don't know. We're going to see what happens. Maybe I'll just abandon the village altogether. Who knows? But let's get back into the book. Let's get back into Crypt of the Sorcerer. So, what is the premise for uh, Crypt of the Sorcerer? Well, it starts off with you in a town called Chalice. You know, Chalice is a mining village. And, you know, because it's mining, you gotta, you gotta assume that miners are involved. Well, they are. So basically, you've, uh, you've got Razak. He is a powerful necromancer, but he was defeated by Kull using his own sword against him. Um, but unfortunately, Kull's, because the sword's magic, Kull was just doomed for eternity to hold the sword. Kull's like sort of like a Grim Reaper dude floating around in the river now. And, um, but yeah, so Razak was entombed. He was, uh, buried. But then, because obviously Chalice is a mining village, you got miners who uh, didn't know any better, and they've uncovered and opened up this tomb, and now Razak is back to life. So, you've actually got a very big threat. You've got to deal with this massive threat, and it's looming, and it's, uh, it's actually quite intense. You know, this book is fairly intense. You know there's a plague coming along, because Razak is just wrecking havoc upon the world. Because he can, because he's that powerful. And the book, like I said, portrays him as being very powerful. It's actually really, really good. So you got Yaz Tromo, he's a, a reoccurring character. He's a great wizard, lovely fella. But he sends you off now to find Krell's sword, or Kull's sword, to slay Razak. Well, it's Razak's sword, isn't it? It's not his. But he sends you off to grab this sword, and then he sends you off to slay Razak. That's the whole, the whole story summarised in, what, one sentence? It's a... Uh, it's not too much, but it feels like an adventure, but, but I think it's time that we talk about the covers, because the covers are, well, it's just fun looking at some old artwork, so uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's go. So, you got the Puffins cover, and it shows Razak in his uh, original glory, he looks less human and more quite undead, he's quite scary, he's got a bulbous head, he's casting some magic, there's skulls flying up through the floor in the background, or for a well. And uh, all in all, it's a really good cover. It's actually really atmospheric. He sort of looks like my uh, my necromancer from uh, from Age of Sigmar's Warcry, which I didn't realise. They sort of look similar. I could I could go back and uh, paint up another necromancer to look like him. I don't know. I don't know. But either way, this is a really atmospheric cover. I actually really like it. You know, it's quite scary. It's quite creepy. You've got Razak himself looking quite creepy, and. It, uh, the book describes him as being quite deformed and you can see his like creepy uh, elongated arm hanging in the background and his like withered one casting spells. You get a sense of what Razak is. He is uh, he's been corrupted by the evil magic he uses by the various demonic pacts that he has made with various demons. He's a very creepy evil looking character. I actually love the Puffin cover. It is so cool. Is actually amazing. I wish they did it for the Wizards cover, to be honest, because the Wizards cover, as we're going to see, doesn't really have the same impact. It doesn't pack a punch as much as the Puffin one does. So, I think, you know, we've mentioned it. Let's actually look at the Wizards cover now. So, without further ado, let's go into Wizards. Let's go. So, we got the Wizards cover, and it's uh, just Razak surrounded by flies. you got a skull in the, in the corner. 
And that's about it, you know. It really draws on the fact that uh, Razak's essentially unleashing plague on the uh, on the world. But uh, Razak's design itself isn't that nice, in my opinion. It's pretty pretty mediocre compared to the old one. He looks more human, you know. He's got one bulbous eye. He doesn't have that creepy vein that's described in the book. And then his eye that's meant to be tiny just sort of looks in proportion to the rest of him. You know, he's missing a nose. He's got a weird smile. It doesn't really come across as... Um, being like a deformity it just looks like he's got a cheeky smile going on you can't tell that his other arm's withered and unless you pay attention you're not going to realize that his other arm has been elongated you know it sort of sort of downplays the guy's deformities and i think the deformities were really part of his character they made him quite interesting and um i'm gonna speculate as to why because uh, let's be real, we haven't got a scholastic cover, but I can talk about what I think it would have been. But yeah, you know, I don't really care for the wizard's cover, you know. It is cool, it is cool, but I don't know, he doesn't really look like a necromancer. He just sort of looks like a shaman or something like that, an evil dude. He's not really, nothing screams necromancer when he's unleashing plagues upon the world. Maybe if he had some skeletons in the background, maybe some of his uh, worshippers, but no, there's nothing really going on. I mean... If you look really closely, and I mean closely, I mean I've got the buck like, what, six inches away from my face? I think he's in a tomb. I think he's in a tomb, but then they just put the overlay of the bugs over it. I don't know why. Kind of ruins it. But yeah, the wizard's cover is what it is. Both covers are nice, but the wizard's one doesn't really do it for me. So... I'm going to talk about now what I would have, what I'd uh, presume or assume the Scholastic cover would have been. So obviously we haven't got a Scholastic uh, cover. They didn't reprint this book. They didn't republish it. Fair enough. And in all honesty, I think, I'm going to say it. I think it's because uh, Razak's quite deformed. And I don't think they wanted to make uh, a sort of connection with physical deformities and evil. Because obviously we live in a day and age where that could upset quite a few people, especially those who aren't willing to actually interact with the media, who aren't willing to read about Rizak, who understand why he is the way he is. So I think they just dodged a bullet entirely and just didn't republish the book. In my opinion, what they could have done, there's a scene in the book where you actually encounter Cull and grab his sword. They could have just put that on the cover instead because then it's a pivotal moment in the story. It totally relates to the story. But then it avoids showing off Razak in all his glory. I don't know. Maybe it's just because the book's really difficult, to be brutally honest. You get item checked an awful lot. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't work for Scholastic. I'm not going to pretend I do. Which, uh, it is what it is. We don't have a Scholastic version. I would have loved to have seen Razak reprinted in all his glory. But, uh, there we are. We don't have it. So, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. It is what it is. If I had to uh, rate these book covers, well, it's just going to be first and second, isn't it? And uh, if you couldn't guess, the Puffin one has to be first. I love the Puffin cover. It is amazing. It's atmospheric. It's creepy. Razak looks accurate. I just love it. And then obviously you've got the Wizards version. And, uh, well, it just doesn't have the same sort of impact. And this is the thing. I do like both the covers. I like them both. I just think that... Razak on the Wizards cover doesn't really represent Razak in the illustrations as well. And I don't get the scene because it just looks like maybe they've just overlaid like bugs flying in the sky inside of a tomb. And that looks kind of weird. Once you realise that's what's happening, it's, it's really weird and off-putting. But it, it is what it is. Razak doesn't really look how he looks in the book on the Wizards version. They sort of tried updating his appearance. And I just don't really like his updated appearance. It's uh, Like I said, you know, it is what it is. So we've got Puffin coming in first. Wizards coming in second. And a Scholastic uh, is not applicable. We don't have a Scholastic cover. But, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about the story. Because the story itself is actually quite good. It's quite the adventure. So we got a little bit on the back. It says, uh, an ancient evil is stirring in the bowels of the earth and the land is blighted. After being entombed for 100 years, the necromancer Razak has been reawoken and is poised to fulfill his promise of death and tyranny. His army of undead are at large across Alandia, bringing death and destruction to all who resist. It is up to you to find the only weapon to which Razak is vulnerable, his own magic sword, only then might you survive the dangers that await you in his evil lair, the Crypt of the Sorcerer. 
So that basically sums it up. That is a really, really good and accurate description of the story. So it's a nice little summary as to what's going to happen. And it basically plays out as it uh, as it implies, you know. You are sort of sent by Yastromo to find this sword. And then you return to him. And then you, uh, you're just sent off then to slay his arc. It's, uh, it is what it is. It's a beautiful little story and it feels like a big adventure. So uh, let's uh, let's start talking about the adventure itself. Let's go. So the adventure really starts off with you in Yastroma's tower and he sort of fills you in as to what you need to do. He sort of tells you the plan and he gives you a health potion that has five swigs, which I thought that was pretty cool. And then you sort of say, okay, pal, I'm off. You jump on your horse and then you set off. You set off on the adventure. So... Without spoiling too much about what actually happens in what, the first, first third? One of my favourite encounters has to be, you come across like, this hunter's uh, cabin. It's, no, he's a fur trapper or something. You come across his cabin and it's been ruined, you know. You go inside and you see the guy, He's uh, he's been game over. He's got arrows sticking in him. So you sort of loot him, you take his uh, hunter's knife, you put it in your pocket and you sort of bury the guy. You give him uh, a little bit of respect. So you head on off and then shortly after you're greeted by this uh, bone master, this old man who starts throwing bones at you. And then once you establish that you're actually friendly, he's like, oh, bro, I like, uh, I like knives. Give me a knife and I'll give you uh, a ring. So you're like, well, I've got this knife that I'm not going to use, so I have this pal. He gives you a ring then, and it's uh, it's like an anti-werewolf ring. And now, if I remember correctly, it's something like, I don't know, you've got to turn to like a reference to use it when you encounter a werewolf. That's all I can remember. You get given like a little ditty to go with it. And uh, yeah, in my opinion, right, from what I played, I never actually encountered this werewolf. I was quite disappointed. I wanted to see what would happen. But I never actually encountered this werewolf. And you're not really... I, I wasn't really item jacked on this ring. I don't think you need this ring to win. But that uh, that's beside the point. And then I think my next favourite encounter has to be this uh, griffin. There's a barbarian lady riding a griffin. And they attack you. And this fight's actually pretty cool to be honest. Because uh, I think when you win it's just the griffin falls down. He like, just sort of plummets to the earth. Everyone just gets mangled. Well the barbarian woman and the griffin. They're both mangled. They're both game over. You go over... And you steal. Well, you, is it stealing? Is it looting? Well, you won, don't you? So it's your reward. You take the shield off them. And the shield is actually really good. It's the defender. I think it's a key item. What I'm saying is, I think. It's a key item that you need towards the end of the game. You do get item checked as to whether or not you have this shield. You need this shield. So you take the shield. You put it on your back. And you head on off. And this is really where you find the Cull Sword. You're like sort of at this lake. In this massive lake and you're just sort of waiting around for this guy to come over and you see a raft coming towards you from the distance there's like a cloaked figure on the raft and then as you get close you're like oh it is it's Carl and he's holding a sword and he comes towards you and you take the sword from his hand and then Carl just sort of collapses in a heap so he's not really he's not an animated skeleton I don't think there is a fight with him he's just sort of petrified you take the sword he crumbles away and then sort of the curse is on you. You uh, you don't even have to deal with the curse yourself. Uh, Yaz Tromo does it for you. But you got the sword. So then you head back off to Yaz Tromo. And that's, uh, that's really just sort of a summary as to what happens in the first third. So when you get back to Yaz Tromo's castle, well his tower, you sort of see his vegetable garden has died. Everything's brown, everything's rotten, everything is withered. And the grass is dying, everything is dying. Now, if you're paying attention to the book, and this is what I really liked... You you sort of understand that Razak has been there. You can tell he's been there because this is what he does. This is sort of like his trademark. He's killed every all the vegetation around it. So like a crow or a raven, I think it's a crow, comes down, drops a note in your hand, and he's like, oh, this is where Yaz Tromo has been taken. So you're like, wow, okay, well, I need to go rescue this boy, don't I? I need to go save him. And uh, you're on your way then. You gallop in through the forest, and a sort of like a god intervenes and he's like yo uh, that crow basically you're being led into a, a trap this is where Yastromo actually is he's going to be sacrificed if you don't set up, save him you you gotta go bro and this is really like a dilemma because you're given the option then of trusting this uh, mysterious god the god's called Suma um, you could trust him or her 
or you can ignore their advice. I, uh, I was feeling cheeky, so I actually followed the guy's advice. And Yanstrom, I was actually being held by this massive demon spawn. And then he's like, yo, you gotta use Razak Sword on it to defeat it, because it's not gonna be able to be defeated by, re like, usual, regular means. So you pull out Razak Sword, you cut the thing down, and you save Yanstrom. It's really good. I actually quite like this bit, because uh, I'm under the impression that if you don't save the guy, you get game over it. But then you get uh, jumped by two demon worshippers if you don't go. Because uh, I personally didn't go down this path. But, you know, flicking through the book, you will see two demon worshippers leaving a house. So I'm guessing, making an educated guess, that's what happens. But yeah, you know, you follow the god's advice, you save Gastromo. And uh, bish bash bosh. Well, he doesn't give you any good nosh. But you save him. And then, really, your next objective is to get a horn from this giant lizard thing. I'm going to be honest, I told a fib then, because your next objective is to find this graveyard where you just need to go there to find, um, what's his name, Razak's father's gravestone. You need to find this gravestone because Yaztroma's friend was meant to go there himself, but it's just implied that Yaztroma's friend didn't make oh. it. He was uh, presumably game over, on the way. So you head on off and you sort of need to make your own way there. Nothing is signposted on this. You're sort of like, oh, I don't know where I am. Let's go this way. And then, fortunately, well, either you do find it or you don't. I found it, and let's just say you do actually need to find it. When you're actually at the graveyard, you find Razak's father's tombstone, and it tells you that he died at uh, the age of, you know, this specific age. You need to remember that age. You need to write that down. It uh, You get reference checked towards the end. You need to remember this age. And then that's really it. You don't really do much in uh, in the graveyard. If you're wearing a ring... You do get attacked by skeletons. You sort of reanimate these skeletons by accident. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, I didn't have the ring on. So, you know, I lied and I was like, yeah, I've got the ring on. Let's see what happens. But if you don't have the ring on, you're pretty much safe. And um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say there. It's a, it's a really nice, it's short and sweet, you know. You go there, you come out. And then you head off, I think, to Stonebridge where you meet Bori the Dwarf. And he's got what is uh, sort of like a fantasy hot air balloon. You jump on there and that really starts off your next adventure where you're trying to find this giant lizard. So this really is like the third, the second third of the game, of the book. You're sort of looking for the Gargantus because you need his horn to punch through Razak's heart to defeat him. And um, you're sort of sailing through the air in a hot air balloon. Personally, I found the second third of the book to be the least interesting part i didn't really enjoy this bit because for me i don't know if like every single choice you make sort of ashes you into the same tunnels but i felt like either i just made all the right choices or yeah you just get ushered in but i found myself in the tunnels really really quickly and it just sort of it was kind of like oh okay but yeah you find yourself in the tunnel fighting the gargantus and you get item checked you get item checked and you uh you need silver rods otherwise you get game over it's because when you attack the gargantus he has a special power and it uh it sort of attacks you mentally so then it turns you against your two companions because at this point you got two companions you got bari the dwarf and sim sort of like he's sort of like a rogue a ranger kind of character sims is actually really really cool he is really cool to be fair but it turns you against them so you cut them both down and it's just so horrible. It's a horrible game over. But if you got this rod, you sort of uh, you sort of cut off the Gargantus's horn. I don't know if uh, if you just slay the guy. I don't see the point in slaying him just for a horn. But it is what it is. You know, at the end of the day, you get out, and um, you've got this horn. So you get back in a hot air balloon. You're flying through the sky. Would you believe um, a big red dragon attacks you at the blue? You get attacked by this big red dragon. Now, if you remember Sumo's uh, number, because it's, it's spoilers, the guy is called Sumo11. If you remember Sumo11, it's like, oh, you can call upon me if you remember my number. And then what actually happens is uh, the dragon burns the hot air blow. So you're falling through the sky, and all of a sudden the dragon flies underneath you, and you're all around on the dragon. And he just sort of takes you where you need to go. Which I thought was really, really nice, to be fair. Presumably, if you forgot the reference, you just sort of plumb it to the ground and get the game over. It's all very horrible. But then, this is really the second, well, the final third of the book. 
And um, when you're reading the book, if you do read the book yourself, you're gonna notice the first third is really good. The second one feels a bit feels a bit rushed, and then it sort of pushes you straight into the final third. There really isn't like a part where you go back to Yastroma and he's like, "Yeah, you gotta do this." You sort of and you're there. You're you're at the final part of the book. But without further ado, let's talk about the final part of the book, which because I like the final bit. So the final bit of the book really is just you entering the crypt of the sorcerer. So you, Sims and Bari, are sort of waiting at the top, and it's it comes down to Sims and Bari being like, "This isn't our adventure. You should be the one that goes down and slays Razak," which is fair enough because you're the only one with a sword that can do it. And they have, and they pretty much know they would be game over by entering. So this is it. You go down into the crypt. Well, the first, the first option you get, you gotta wait for a demon worshiper to come out, and then you will sort of jump him. You don't get anything from him, but I'm under the assumption that if you go down, he sees you on the stairs and alerts everyone. But uh, you jump this demon worshiper, you go down, and then you sort of just explore. So, cause I read City of Thieves, like literally like 48 hours before reading this book i sort of didn't explore i didn't explore that much this part because i just wanted because <sighs> city of thieves you just got item checked and if you didn't have the item you died and that's about it so with me now i just went on and there's a massive chair there's a cool chair so i'm like oh that, that thing looks really comfy let's sit on it and boom you get an item checked you're getting reference checks you're getting quizzed on the book and one of the questions is uh how old was Razak's father when he passed away so if you don't know this i'm under the assumption you just get game over but if you answer all these correctly guess what you get to see razak razak himself this bad boy actually looks really cool in the illustrations it's a shame that uh, the wizard's uh, cover doesn't do him justice to be honest but this fight is actually really uh you get item checked every single reference and if you don't have any of these items guess what game over bro so if you have all these items, Razak is uh, slain. The encounter itself is actually really good because Razak comes across as being very intelligent. You know, he's like, okay, you can deflect this, but what about this? Okay, maybe that one, but what about this? It's actually a really nice encounter. I really liked Razak's battle, shall we say. And uh, there's a point where. After you get the sword to slay Razak, a centaur attacks you. And you're like, why is this centaur attacking me? But you slay him, you take the amulet from him. He's got like a pendant on, he's wearing a necklace. You can put it on, nothing happens. But when you encounter Razak, guess what? It's like, oh, are you wearing that necklace that the centaur is wearing? And if you say yeah, you're under Razak's control. It's a slave necklace. And um, Razak is very aware that you are coming after him throughout the book. And that's something that's really good. If you look back, you know, the crow was likely Razak's crow. Because he had been there. Um, you got demon worshippers. You've had the centaur coming after you. He was very aware. The dragon was probably his. He knew you were coming and he did not want to fight you. He was, uh, he was concerned. So you take on this guy. You defeat him. Really, really good fight. Actually, I don't know if you fight him or if you just get reference checked. I can't remember. I think you just get item checked. So you defeat this guy, you uh, then you just have to get out. That's your main objective. You need to run. Because if you don't run back out of the crypt, it all falls apart on you and you get game over. But if you do get out, congrats. You've, you've finished it, boys. You've, uh, you've completed the Crypt of the Sorcerer. So then your next objective was, it's not really, it's sort of like written as this is more of like a story. So Yaz Tromo then cures you of the curse. You chuck the sword back into the fissure, um, and then it's sort of done and dusted. You've saved Alansia from a horrible fate. You are truly a hero. And I really like this ending. So we're finished with the story, so let's just talk about the book. And uh, let's have a sit down, let's have a cheeky chat about the book itself. In my opinion, I really liked it, you know. I think the book's only real downfall is how segmented it felt. Because very similar to Caverns of the Snow Witch, there's, very, there's a very clear-cut first, second and third segment. Which only really became problematic when uh, the first and last segment vastly overshadowed the middle segment. 
I don't know if they could have done it better. I think it's a bit too late now, feedback wise. This book's what, 40 years old? So we're not going to get any uh, any sort of. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to go back and redo it. But yeah, I think the book is really good. I'd recommend it. You Obviously, you can't get a Scholastic version, so you'd have to get a secondhand Wizard or Puffin version. And even then, you know, the inside illustrations are exactly the same, so it's literally just the cover that changes. So it's going to come down to your own personal preference. This book is difficult, but it's not too difficult. It's challenging, but in a fun way. Unlike Creature of Havoc, which was a story I didn't really enjoy that much because of how convoluted and difficult it was made purely to be convoluted and difficult this book's sort of challenging but in a fun way it's not a pushover but it's not too challenging you know you're going to read this and it's going to give you a very good experience unlike warlock of firetop mountain like per se you're not faced with obnoxious mazes made to be difficult for the sake of padding out the story you are constantly doing something in this one you are constantly pursuing an objective engaging with npcs or otherwise just sort of traversing the land i thought that was really good that was done really really well in my opinion so if i had to summarize this book in like what one sentence i'd say it's an enjoyable challenge it's a really really good book and that's about it you know it's a really good book i think you're gonna need to read this i don't think a book can be done justice with a video because there's a lot of stuff i missed I want to be more vague because I felt like I spoiled so much in my earlier videos, but now I'm feeling like I'm too vague, so I'm going to try and find like a, a midpoint, but yeah. So the next uh, book we're doing is Forest of Doom, number 8 in the series, and you might be thinking, well, what about number 7? Well, I read House of Hell out of order before I ordered all these books, so then we got, yeah, Forest of Doom, and then I think... The next one is number 10, because obviously I read Caverns of the Snow Witch out of order, which is a sorcery book, which has loads of magic, which is actually really good. I just need to order it. So that's about it, guys. I'm going to have to leave you there. If you've uh, watched this video to this far, can I get a cheeky oh yeah in the comments? Uh, you you know what I mean. Give me a cheeky uh, oh yeah in the comments. And obviously, don't forget to like, subscribe. You can leave a comment. Like I said, Forest of Doom is next week's video. I explained it why. Um, but yeah, I hope you have a nice week. I hope you take care. And I hope, if uh, if you've been feeling down, this video's cheered you up a bit. So, without further ado, take care. Have a lovely week. Goodbye.